The other events of my sixth grade year blur into a fog. I don't remember the name of our school principal. I don't remember the name of that brown-haired girl upon whom I had a crush. I don't remember what we did for the holidays. I don't even remember what grades I made. But that one spring evening in 1967 is crystal clear. I can still see myself sitting in my parents' bedroom. Dinner, dinner table conversation wafts down the hallway. We have guests over, but I have asked to be excused early from the table. My mom has baked apple pie, but I even passed on dessert. Who has time for chit-chat and pastries at a time like this? I am waiting on the phone to ring. I expected the phone to ring before the meal, but the call didn't come. I assumed the phone would ring during the meal, but the phone did not. Now I'm staring at the phone like a dog at a bone. <laughs> I'm hoping the little league coach will call and tell me that I have made his team. So I'm sitting on the bed. My glove is at my side. My baseball bat is at my side. I don't know why. Just thought I needed it in case he called. <laughs> I can hear kids playing out on the street in the front of the house, but I do not dare leave the house to join them. I'm waiting on the call. I'm waiting on the phone to ring, but it doesn't. And the guests leave. And I go back and help with the dishes. Mom has comforting words. My dad pats me on the back. And I keep an ear toward the phone, but it doesn't ring. It's just silent, painfully silent. You know, in the great scheme of things, not making a little league team is not a big deal. But 12-year-olds don't think of the great scheme of things. And all I could think about was what the kids would say and what I would say when we talked about the team we were on, or in my case wasn't on, the next day. I wonder if you know that feeling. The phone didn't ring for you either, and maybe in a much grander scheme of things. When you applied for the job, when you hoped you'd receive at least the interview, when you sent in your application, when you tried to make up or get help, the call never came. You know the pain of a no call. We all do, it's so much so that we've coined phrases to describe the moment. He was left standing out in the cold. And she was left standing at the altar. Ooh, that one hurts. Or he was left holding the bag. Or my favorite, he's out tending sheep in the pasture. You haven't heard that one? David had. And the story of David begins with him out tending sheep in the pasture. If you like to fill in the blanks as we look at the story of David today, we begin with a nation in chaos. It was a tough situation. It was a tough situation. The nation was in chaos. The reason that we're looking at the story of David is because the next chapter in the story that we're looking at, the story of God, takes us into the story of David. 
We're looking at the whole scope of Scripture, beginning in creation, ending in Revelation, one major event at the time, using the story, which is a chronological version of the Bible, and it gives us a chance to move all the way through the Bible in 30 weeks on a timeline. Last week we looked at the story of Saul, today we look at the story of David. And the story of David begins really with the story of Samuel. First, first Samuel chapter 16 describes Samuel himself. He's portrayed as a silver-bearded priest ambling down a narrow trail toward the town of Bethlehem. He pulls a heifer behind him. He has a small village ahead of him, and he has a lot of anxiety brewing within him. The people who notice him as he comes by wonder what in the world an important priest like Samuel is doing headed toward a forgotten hamlet like Bethlehem. Samuel, they think. Samuel, mothered by Hannah, tutored or mentored by Eli, called by God, and when the sons of Eli turned south, as Samuel stepped forward and he became the spiritual leader of ancient Israel. And when Israel needed spiritual focus, he provided it. And when Israel wanted a king, he anointed one. At great hesitation, he anointed Saul. Oh, the very name Saul caused Samuel to groan. Tall Saul, strong Saul. The Israelites wanted a king, and now we have a king. They wanted a leader, and now we have a laos. Samuel glanced from side to side, hoping nobody heard him say that out loud. No one heard him. He was safe, as safe as any person could be during the reign of a king gone manic. Saul's eyes were growing wilder by the day and his heart was growing harder by the day. He wasn't the king he used to be. In fact, in God's eyes, he wasn't even king at all. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 1 or page 145 in the story, if you'd like to read, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So 1000 BC is a time of transition from one king to the next, from one era to the next. Three centuries of frozen faith have left the people in a spiritual winter. One writer describes the days between Joshua and Samuel by saying, in those days Israel did not have a king and everyone did what seemed right. It was a time of unending corruption. And then there was the problem of the Philistines. The Philistines were those giant, breeding, war-loving, bloodthirsty neighbors. If if they were the grizzlies, then the Hebrews were salmon. They just kept gobbling them up. They had everything that the Hebrews did not. They had the monopoly on, on iron and blacksmithing. Consequently, they had swords and spears and, and iron-wheeled chariots. While the Philistines forged weapons, the Hebrews fought with crude slings and arrows. While the Philistines thundered in their chariots, the Israelites retaliated with farm tools and knives. Why? There was one particular battle where the entire nation of Israel owned only two swords, one for Jonathan and one for Saul. So it was a tough time. Corruption from within, danger from without. Saul was weak, the nation increasingly weaker. What should Samuel do? Or better asked, what would God do well, he did what no one imagined. He issued a surprise invitation to the nobody from Nowheresville. God dispatched Samuel to the town of Red Eye, Minnesota. Not really. He sent him to Sawgrass, 
Mississippi. <laughs> Not exactly. He gave him a bus ticket and told him to go to Mule Shoe, Texas. Well, no. Not exactly, but he could have had he been alive today because Bethlehem in his day was the equivalent to a mule shoe or a red eye or a sawgrass, a forgotten hamlet, six miles south of Jerusalem. A few hundred years earlier, it, it had been the home of Ruth. We read her story. A thousand years from now, it will be the home of a baby born in Bethlehem, his name. Now, if you can't fill in that blank, I'm <laughs> really concerned. But a thousand years before Jesus will be born in Bethlehem, it is the home of a shepherd boy whose story begins out tending the sheep. So Samuel has come to this little town. I'm sure the people wondered, what in the world is Samuel doing here? Prophets don't come to Bethlehem. He assures them that he's there simply to offer a sacrifice, and he invites all the leaders of the city to join him. And he also invites Jesse to come and tells Jesse to bring all eight of his sons. As it turned out, this invitation... Well, there was more to it than Samuel led on. He was there to select a king. God told him to go to the house of Jesse. We're not told exactly how God told him that, but we are told what happened when he met with the family of Jesse. It's a delightful scene. It has a dog show feel to it. And Jesse paraded his boys one at a time in front of Samuel kind of like canines on leashes. And Samuel examined them from several angles, more than once ready to give one of the sons the blue ribbon and call him king. But God would always stop him. It started like this. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Eliab, the oldest, seemed like the logical choice. He was the firstborn son. Seemed like the logical choice to replace Saul as king, King Eliab. We envision Eliab as the village Casanova. Wavy hair, strong jaw. He wears these tight wranglers. <laughs> big belt buckle. Got a piano keyboard smile. This is the guy, Samuel thinks. No, God says. And then he explains, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Abinadab enters as brother and contestant number two. You would have thought a GQ model had just walked in. Abinadab wears an Italian suit, alligator shoes, jet black oiled back hair. You want a classy king? Abinadab's got bling bling. <laughs> but God's not into classy. Samuel asked for brother number three. His name is Shama. He's bookish. He's studious. Walked right out of the library. He could use a charisma transplant, but he's busting with brains. He had a degree from the State University, and he's already applied for some postgraduate study in Egypt. And Jesse told Samuel he was the valedictorian of Bethlehem High. <laughs> Samuel was impressed, but God wasn't. I'm still in 1 Samuel 16, still on page 145 in the story. He reminded the priest, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So seven sons pass and seven sons fail. The procession comes to a halt and Jesse is quiet. Samuel looks around the room and he counts the sons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven 
And then he looks at Jesse and he says, Jesse, don't you? Don't you have eight sons? A similar question caused the stepmother of Cinderella to squirm. (laughs) And I'm thinking that Jesse must have squirmed as well. And here was his response. There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Last time that I remember we as a church studied this story was way back in 2005. And if you were around then and you have a really keen memory, I remember we made a real big deal about that verse. There is still the youngest. It's a Hebrew word pronounced something like hakaton. I like to say it just because it's fun to say. It's kind of like clearing your throat. Hakaton. Hakata. I know you're dying to try it. Give it a go. Hakatan. Hakatan. There is still the Hakatan. Best I can tell, the more literal translation of that word would be the English word R U N T. <laughs> There's still the runt. We have any youngest siblings? In the room, raise your hand if you're a youngest sibling. I was the youngest of four. I am the youngest of four. I guess that hadn't changed. <laughs> and I can remember my older sisters and brother occasionally saying, Oh, he's the baby. He's the baby. He's the hakaton. He's the runt of the family. He's the baby. And so here the father says that. Jesse says that. Yeah, I've got seven sons, but don't you have one more? Well, yeah, I've got a runt. (laughs) How would you feel if you learned there was a family meeting of your family and you weren't invited? There's a runt and he's out taking care of the sheep. We've got him where runts deserve to be. Out in the pasture where they can't cause any trouble. Just hanging out with the woolly heads. We do have the runt. We do have the hakaton. Leave him out there where he should be. And so that's where we find David. That's where we find David. If somebody were to carve the Mount Rushmore of faith, his name would be at the base, his face would be in the rock. Wouldn't you agree? 66 chapters in the Bible are dedicated to the story of David. 66. There's only one person in Scripture who gets more space. Jesus Christ. The city of Jerusalem will come to be known as the city of... Jesus himself will come to be called the son of... Even today, the emblem of Israel is called the star of David. We'll know him as the giant killer. He'll bring down Goliath. We'll know him as the worshiper. He'll write psalms that we still read, poems we still quote. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We'll know him as a king. We'll know him as an adulterer. We'll know him as a man after God's own heart. We'll know him as one who struggled, yet found faith and found forgiveness. But where does his story begin? His story begins outside of a sleepy hamlet called Bethlehem. One camel town. Out in the sheep, in the pasture. uncredentialed, forgotten by the family, the one who introduced us to the word Hakatan. Maybe you've been out in that pasture. Maybe you know the sheep field called forgotten, neglected, turned out, 
marginalized, misfit, cast off, too old, too tired, too weak, wrong age, wrong gender, wrong color, wrong training. Maybe you've waited for the phone to ring. That's where we find David. And the story of David picks up a piece of excitement because we see the kind of person that God picks. We wonder, because we know the kind of person that society picks. Society tends to grade us according to the inches of our waist, the square footage of our house, the color of our skin, the make of our car, the label of our clothes, the size of our office, the presence of diplomas, the absence of pimples. But God has a different measure. Again, he says it. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Those words were written for all the misfits of society. God uses us all. And these words offer this great inspiration. God has a place for you. Moses ran from justice, but God used him. Jonah ran from God, but God used him. Rahab ran a brothel. Samson ran to the wrong woman. Jacob ran in the wrong circles. Elijah ran into the mountains. Sarah ran out of hope. Lot ran with the wrong crowd, but God used them all. And David? God saw this teenage boy serving him in the backwoods of Bethlehem. And through the voice of a brother, God called David, come in. And so David stood up and he walked into the family meeting. All the eyes saw a gangly teenager who smelled like sheep. But God saw something different. And the Lord said to Samuel, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Oh, what a beautiful promise comes out of this. The promise might read like this. God picks the nobodies, nobody notices. God picks the nobodies, nobody notices. God picked David. Nobody noticed him. But God did. Because God saw his heart. He came to be known as a man who was after God's own heart. In both ways, he was after God's own heart. He was in pursuit of God's own heart. But he took after God's own heart because the more he pursued God, the more he looked like God. And so when God saw David, he said, now I can work with a heart like that. And here's what you need to know, my friend. God has said the same about you. Now, maybe you don't like what's in your heart. But I want to tell you, you don't get the deciding vote. God does. And he has already cast his vote in your favor. He has seen your heart. And he has decided you are worth redeeming. You are worth purchasing. And he has selected you. He has selected you. In spite of what people have said about you, and in spite of what you say about you, God has selected you. And he will do for you what Samuel did for David. He will anoint you. He will anoint you. Not with the oil of a priest, but with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he will wash you clean. And he'll call you into his kingdom. Here's the big news. God is for you. God is for you. Do you agree with him? Now here's a question. Are you for you? God is for you. Are you for you? Or are you against you? You see, David could have resisted. 
David could have said, oh, I'm too inexperienced or, or I'm too young or I'm, or I'm too stupid. He, he, he could have had a thousand and one reasons to resist that anointing, but he received it. He, he agreed. He agreed with Samuel's declaration. In doing so, agreed with God's declaration. If God is for me, then I'm going to be for me. You know, you can be either your worst critic or your greatest cheerleader. You can be your worst critic or your greatest cheerleader. Which are you? Think about the words you say to yourself. Think about the words you say to yourself. The words that make the biggest difference in your life really are not the words that you remember from your parents or the words you remember from your siblings or even the words at your workplace, but they are the words you say to you about you. What do you say to you about you? Do you ever beat yourself up? Do you find the voice that keeps playing over and over in your head is, is, is loaded with phrases like, well, I'm, I'm not good enough. Or I'm too old. Or I'm too dumb. Or I'm too inexperienced. Or I'm too brown, too black, too white, too young. When you do that, my friend, what you're doing is you are disagreeing with God. You're disagreeing with God and you are agreeing with the devil. Because that's his assessment of you. And those words do not come from heaven. Those words come from the devil. And when you agree with what the devil says about you, then in essence you're opening your spirit up to the work of the devil. So you've got to stop that. I mean, you can't tolerate that one moment. I'm not saying that you pretend that you don't have struggles or weaknesses, but I do say that you must agree with God that you have been selected, you have been anointed, you have been called for a high and holy purpose that God has looked at your life from beginning to end and he has decided and he has declared and he is the only judge in the universe and he outranks you and he has declared that you are destined for his kingdom. And even when troubles come and troubles go, that does not change. And when the storms come and the storms pass, that does not change. What God has said about you is determined by God himself. And the reason that stories like the story of David are in the Bible not just for our not just for our entertainment but for our inspiration because we've all been in that pasture and we need to hear God call us out of it. And so the question lingers, are you for you? The Apostle Paul models how this works. The Apostle Paul said, if God is for us, who could be against us? Look what Paul discovered. God is for us. You're valuable, you're pers purposeful, you're important to God. He says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. So if God is for you, shouldn't you be for you? You can nod if you want. If God is for you, shouldn't you be for you? But you're against yourself when you call yourself dumb or ugly or a failure you are against you when you tell yourself there is no solution there is no hope there is no promise you are against you when you decide that you have no talents or no treasure or no future these words these words work against you and if you tell yourself something often enough you will believe it If you tell yourself something often enough, you will believe it. If you roll out of bed tomorrow morning saying, Oh, terrible, this is a yucky, awful day. Guess what? Oh, terrible, yucky, awful day. It will become. Words have power. Power to bring life.
or power to bring death. And if you go to work or go to school tomorrow thinking, I can't do it, I'm going to fail, it's just a matter of time, I'm an utter slob, these words are toxic. And they actually agree with the devil. So you tell him to get lost. And you hold fast the promises of Scripture. Here's how people of God think. They think like the Apostle Paul who said, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the passage of a person who feels anointed by God, called by God, living by God. And these passages exist so that we can not just read them, but so that we can personalize them. A personalized passage would read like this. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither poor health, neither college debt, neither pink slips, neither today's deadline or tomorrow's diagnosis, nor any job transfers, neither addictions or moral failures. Thank you.